Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter. On this episode, we are going to discuss modern portfolio theory and how it has failed investors and what a change in direction could look like for your portfolios. Joining me is Daniel Paris. He oversees $20 billion in equity portfolios as a senior portfolio manager at Federated Investors. He is the author of three books, The Strategic Dividend Investor, The Dividend Imperative, and his newly released book, Getting Back to Business. He holds a PhD, and he's also earned the CFA designation. Daniel, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Jay. So I've been looking forward to this interview because I, clearly like yourself, have been a skeptic of MPT for a while. But you go very, very deep on this topic. Let's, let's break this interview into three parts. The history of modern portfolio theory, how it has failed, and then some solutions that you have outlined in your new book. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Could you walk listeners through the history of modern portfolio theory? Sure. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Uh, I, I was originally trained as a historian and uh, ended up in finance a, a bit by accident. But once I'd settled in as a uh, stock analyst and then portfolio manager and, and having memorized all the rules that I was expected to memorize, uh, getting that CFA uh, certification, I began as a historian to ask, well, where, where did all these rules come from? That's my natural uh, I'm wired that way uh, to to approach uh, tricky things as a, from a historical perspective and understand how they came about, and that led into a you know multi-year review of where what we consider a given set of rules came from, uh, and it turns out that that given set of rules, modern portfolio theory, has a very specific history, and that takes up about two thirds of the book of getting back to business, highlighting that and showing people that this. Uh, a set of rules that they assume is has always been the case and is, as it were, always correct and appropriate, in fact, has a very specific point of origin coming out of the uh, depression and the crash, and then a series of very smart, very intense, uh, kind of social science-oriented, math-oriented uh, fellows, all, mostly fellows, in the 1950s and 60s, trying to come up with a better system using all of the mid-century confidence in mathematical uh, forecasting and uh, mathematical models of human behavior, rational actor theory. And so uh, modern portfolio theory is developed in its, you know, the core of it in the 1950s, it's refined in the 60s and 70s, and it applied in the 70s and 80s and going on. But if you look back at it, you see a very mid 20th century paradigm. And the big question that financial advisors and investors, and I was asking myself this, is, is this dated, aged paradigm still appropriate? The problems that Harry Markowitz and uh, James Tobin and, and uh, William Sharp were all answering in the 50s and 60s were important problems at the time because they were still reflecting upon what had happened in the crash and the depression and the absence of any theory in the 1920s and 30s. I have some uh, anecdotes in the book about you know, the wild and woolly 1920s and then everything goes south in the 1930s and people begin to uh, start asking questions. They're um, uh, ben Graham and uh, John Burr Williams and John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s. These are academics and investors ask, beginning to ask a, uh, questions about how this all happened and how do we get into such a mess. But in the 1950s and 60s, uh, kind of quieter times, uh, the solution to this historical problem and to many of society's problems at the time was determined to be almost math, finance, rules, rational actor theory. Let's figure this out. This looks like a system. We'll take a systems approach. It's uh, one of the great economists at the time, uh, Paul Samuelson, drew his macroeconomic theories from a thermodynamics, a system, pumps, and so forth, lots of mechanical metaphors. So that was the age of uh, space shots, the space race, and uh, big new computers, and a lot of great hope and expectations about how a lot of society's problems will be resolved. One of those problems or issues 
at uh, the finance people, and that finance was just emerging as a, a science, was the uncertainty associated with the capital markets. There was really no rule or reason or understanding of the capital markets. And so these very smart people, almost all of whom now have Nobel Prizes, um, came up with a lot of rules to describe how risk and return could be correlated fairly precisely, how you could come up with an expected rate of return, how you could create efficient portfolios. In practice, it ends up leading to many of the tools that all of your advisors, uh, Jay, the people listening today, have on their desktops provided by their their, uh, their, their firms, the big uh, wirehouses, the brokerages, the RIA, RIA technology platforms, all that technology about large cap, mid cap, beta, risk, uh, definitions of risk, uh, benchmarks, being ahead or uh, above of a benchmark, all that comes from the very simple constructs that Harry Markowitz came up in 1952 and 1959, thinking about the 1930s. And the question that I ask is that the system that he came up with, mean variance optimization of, of uh, share price-based uh, returns, um, is that is that a good idea? Is it? It's still a good idea. It was a good idea in the 1950s and 60s because it replaced basically a void. There wasn't much of a system at all. But I think every advisor should uh, know where the intellectual system they're operating in came from and ask periodically whether it still works. Uh, my argument about MPT is that having emerged in the 50s and 60s as a solution to a problem is that 50, 60 years later, it, it really is at best a solution to a problem, not one that's particularly relevant to how people live their lives now, how the capital markets are structured now, uh, and how financial advisors and individual investors could structure their portfolios. So when I got when I was in graduate school at Emory, MPT is you know beat into the curriculum as it has been for a couple of generations now. Is that Correct. is that a fair assumption? Absolutely. And everybody. Yes, and it was it, it filled a void intellectually as well. So it was very from the nineteen mid nineteen seventies on the the. Uh, it really uh, spreads rapidly through business schools, credentialing systems, the credentials that the CFP programs, the uh, CFA uh, program that I went through, it, it spread very quickly because it was, hey, finally, we have a theory. It doesn't make it the right theory, but at least we have a coherent, reasonable, and demonstrable theory. That is based on trying to solve problems from the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, based on a, you know, kind of bigger philosophical issues as well of dealing with uncertainty, that trying to bring certainty to the capital markets, to the human process of decision making, it looked really, really good. And it's very attractive. Why wouldn't you want to have where you want, why wouldn't you, the investor or the financial advisor, want to know where you're going to be on the efficient frontier and the very articulation of an efficient frontier? The efficient frontier for your uh, listeners is, again, that, that line that it defines uh, risk and return and a particular amount of return for a given amount of risk. You can plot it and it creates a nice curve. And Harry Markowitz called it the efficient frontier. It's a very nice name. The math behind it's pretty simple. And why wouldn't you want to, in the 1950s and 60s or coming out of that period, be on the efficient frontier for your investing where you believe you're getting the maximum amount of return for a given amount of risk as he defined it, or the other way around. So it's very attractive. Uh, it just doesn't turn out 50 or 60 years later to be, to be correct. And what are the implications of that not being correct? Well, I, this is where the difference between my role as a historian and pointing out the flaws of an existing paradigm, a dated paradigm, and my day job as an asset manager kind of come into play. I'm a, I'm a dividend manager. I, I focus on cash flows. So I, I broke the book into two parts. The first is the history of modern portfolio theory and providing enough information there, I think, for you know reasonable readers, both to be entertained, there are plenty of jokes and so forth, but also to call into question themselves what whether this system makes a lot of sense mean variance optimization of uh, geometric healing share price based returns that's you know a relative total return to a benchmark basically the second part of the book i propose an alternative which is cash flow based investing as opposed to mean variance op optimization of, of share price based investing now lots of people are going to disagree with my proposed alternative and i'm i'm uh, perfectly uh, fine with that i'm simply calling for everyone pause look at the existing system if you can come up with a better one that's great here's my proposal for the better one now my better one 
is a very business-like orientation that looks at cash flows rather than share prices. Right now, investors, particularly in the stock market, pay little, if any, attention to the dividends received in the market. The yield of the U.S. market is 2%. It's been 2% for uh, several decades. PAT ratio is low, and very few, if any, investors make decisions based on the company's dividend, and the leading companies in the market don't even have dividends. Um, my argument to counter that is that uh, – if we were to apply the standards of business analysis and business management in the private sector or in any equity market outside the United States or the equity market in the United States prior to about 30, 40 years ago when MPT uh, took off, you would be looking less at the cash, uh, less at the share prices and near term share price changes and much more on the cash flows which determine those share prices, as in any private business. The best example, and maybe relevant for, for most of your clients, is, is their book of business. They understand intuitively their book of business and whether the cash flows from it are rising or declining uh, and what that allows them to take home more, or take home less, their clients' uh, affairs. Uh, another good example of kind of common sense approach to asset management through cash flows is real estate, uh, you know, rental real estate, commercial real estate, industrial real estate, which again, many advisors I think will have a, a good sense for. Real estate is not generally run to be sold. There isn't a daily price on, on uh, residential or commercial real estate. Uh, there may be prices, but you're not getting a daily, you know, uh, six hours a, a day price. Instead, what you know from your real estate ventures is what the cash flows are, what the capital you had to put in and the cash flows. And real estate investors will put together a portfolio of cash flows, some rising, some flat, some require more capital, some require less, and manage the cash flows. But essentially, all private businesses are run in that fashion. My argument is to extend that notion of a cash flow based portfolio system to the public equity markets and the public bond markets as well, where we are looking substantially at the cash flows that are received and coming up with a good combination of cash flows. Part of Harry Markowitz's ideas is really very applicable to uh, a cash flow approach rather than a share price based approach. You do want you know, a rising income stream. You want low volatility of the income stream. There may well be an efficient frontier. I, I don't make this argument, but there may well be an efficient frontier of income streams where you get a combination, an ideal combination of uh, lower volatility and higher income streams and so forth. But the focus, shift the focus from the share price on the screen every single day over which we can have little to no control to the underlying cash flows of the businesses that are distributable, which are forecastable and which are real and tangible. That's in essence the, uh, the, the proposed alternative. So from the advisor's perspective, when building portfolios for clients, if they're doing it using stocks, are you suggesting that they put in free cash flow as a factor, dividends as a factor, a combination of that and others, how can an advisor yeah, use this? That's a great example. So it uh, depends on the system, depends on their, their back office and their platform. Most systems will show income generation from an asset, from a collection of assets of cash, uh, equities, bonds, and whatever other assets the system can measure. Uh, not all, but most do show the income. My argument for the financial advisors would be to, instead of basing your communication with the client and the building of that, uh, portfolio around the asset prices and the near-term relative change in those asset prices would be to look at those cash flows, what the dividend expectation of income generation is in each year. And I know a lot of it, advisors for retirees already do this, but look at that income generation, where it's coming from, a portion from bonds, portion from equities, portion from other sources, and begin to engage the client on managing expectations vis-a-vis -vis the income rather than looking at, oh my God, the stock market sold off 2% yesterday or is up 1%. And, you know, we're going to put some Amazon in here or, or whatever. I, I don't want to mention individual <laughs> securities, but I mean, and non, non dividend paying securities. Um, uh, that it, it shift the uh, conversation towards the income generation rather than the, um, the, uh, the share prices. Now, for clients who aren't drawing the income, they may not, you know, younger clients, they may not really care about income generation, but I still think that uh, those clients generally are successful in businesses and they understand income generation and successful businesses because of that income generation, and so it should still uh, uh, appeal with them, appeal to them. One other suggestion, which is really hard, but I think is a good kind of test for a financial advisor, 
is that financial advisors are not generally compensated on and cannot integrate into their, their service that they provide clients uh, private assets. They, they just can't. It's not set up that way. It has to be a publicly traded asset. It has to have a price to it. Mm-hmm. One of the arguments I make in the book is that you know, I think a very – uh, a, a good service that financial advisors can have is to sit down with the clients and understand their private assets as well. And uh, if not formally, then at least informally, when you are creating a portfolio and understanding about the income dynamics and the cash flows that are distributable to the, to the client, that the f- private assets are also included, even though the financial advisor is not paid on them in a typical wrap account. So, you know, that's, it, it doesn't require a wholesale change of systems. It really is encouraging advisors and end clients to shift their gaze on the screen from the, the, the number on the far left, the price, to the number on the far right, the income stream that you might reasonably expect from said asset. Given your deep experience with dividend paying stocks, let's go a little bit deeper. How should an advisor look at the growth rate of that dividend? Should they look at it near term, their one year growth rate, three year, five year? What are some best practices for incorporating that into this type of methodology? That's a, that's a super question, and uh, you know this is why uh, many individual investors should uh, uh, have money uh, managers or advisors helping them do this, and the financial advisors have the professional money managers standing behind them as well. Uh, Within the portfolios I oversee, it's a five-year dividend growth forecast. Uh, uh, that is long enough to get out of the noise, you know, the near-term noise range, but it's short enough to have a reasonable forecasting accuracy. If I could tell you that a certain company is going to pay a certain dividend 10 years from now, you're probably not going to believe me. But if I tell you that a certain company is going to grow its dividend uh, you know, about you know, 6% a year over the next uh, five years, it, it's probably not going to be far off uh, uh, the number. Uh, there are occasion, there are exceptions, but generally not. And so we, we've settled on that five-year uh, mechanism, but uh, uh, there are also companies that are transitioning from lower payout to higher payout. They're really interesting opportunities. So they will have much higher dividend growth rates for the first couple years, and then they they settle out at once they've hit their target payout ratio to uh, a, a more a number that's more in line with their profit growth. Uh, and there are companies that are paying out pretty much all they can, and you can you know reasonably expect them not to really grow the dividend uh, uh, in in a, a forecastable period, say a five year period. But that's that's where you know you want to you want to have someone doing that analysis for you. Uh, but we've chosen as a matter of convenience and sort of efficacy that five year point as where we uh, where how we forecast the dividends. And we use that as a as a generic rate as long as the dividend growth rate. Think about this: as long as the dividend growth rate isn't too much above nominal GDP, then you can use it in a lot of the formulas for net present values or DCS or discounted dividend models. Once you have a company with an exceptional near-term dividend growth rate, you can't really use those in the formulas because they, they come up with nearly infinite values. So you want to be careful about that. But uh, a lot of the, and you know, it's easy to sell that, but it's not such a great idea. But a lot of the, the dividend paying universe are companies that tend to grow in the uh, you know, GDP plus or GDP minus area. And so you can use, use uh, you know, those types of numbers for uh, forecasting their dividend growth. So there is a lot of noise in the marketplace about dividend paying stocks and the impact that a rising rate environment will have on them. Could you share your thoughts on a potential outlook if we do continue to see upward pressure on rates over the next year or two, what that impact will be on dividend payers? Yeah, absolutely. Now, first thing, again, from my perspective of cash flows and business ownership, there's no impact. It doesn't affect the dividends. You're the uh, rising 10-year or Fed funds rate that has no impact whatsoever on, on the cash flows of the corporations uh, that, that tend to populate dividend portfolios. Uh, it is true the cost of debt will go up a little bit, but actually companies are still refinancing debt from five, seven, 10 years ago at lower rates. Rates have gone up, but they were so low, they're actually haven't yet caught up to those prior rates. So debt refinancing is actually still an operational tailwind to uh, most large companies that pay dividends. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of exceptions, and that tailwind will, will soon cease as the lines kind of cross. But for now, it has effectively zero operational impact. If rates rise enough to affect consumers, uh, 
borrowing ability, uh, vendors, distributors, then you can see a, you know, an economic slowdown that will affect everyone. But uh, again, it doesn't, uh, rising rates on their own don't directly affect the cash flows of, of these businesses. Um, but that being said, it, the, the uh, standard wisdom, and it's incorrect again, but it is the standard wisdom is that uh, dividend paying stocks are bond, po- bond proxies, rising rates lower the value because it lowers the present value of those cash flows. Remember, stocks are not bonds. You have a rising dividend. So I understand why rising rates can have a negative impact on bond prices. But as long as a company's dividend is growing and it tends to grow in line with inflation or better, then rising rates really don't, uh, don't have a negative uh, NPV or uh, dividend discount model impact. So it, it uh, on any given day, rising rates do have a share price impact, but over longer measure periods they shouldn't. And uh, again, keep in mind it doesn't really affect uh, cash flows at all. That being said, we bottomed in July of 2016 at about a one and a half percent ten year. It's uh, you know around three percent now. Um, it was certainly a headwind for the prices, not the cash flows, not the monthly checks not the consumption, not the revenues, not the profits, et cetera, of these companies, but a headwind for their share prices. That's, again, one reason why I think it's important for investors and financial advisors to look at those cash flows is to see what's important and what's not. But granted, for the last two years, uh, rising rates have affected the NAV, the share prices of, of these companies adversely. They've lagged the market. The question becomes, where to from here? We've had two years of rising rates. We've had rates have doubled from one and a half percent to three percent on the ten-year. Um, near-term rates are up uh, materially. It really becomes an issue of where where do we go from here? Do do rates continue on to four percent or five percent? Are we done? Uh, who's who's to say? I I don't have. A, uh, a particularly strong view of that. And the reason I can have the luxury of not having a strong view in regard to that is because I know it's not going to affect the cash flows of my businesses. We've set it up. So at least in the businesses that we own, they're not particularly dependent upon uh, those uh, uh, you know, near-term rising rates. You don't have wholesale funded uh, institutions or businesses that require uh, 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 you know, low rates in order for uh, the daily consumption or transactions to occur. So I, I'm kind of neutral on that. I will tell you that while I acknowledge that rising rates have the last two years been a headwind to dividend paying stocks, there are two things to take into consideration. First of all, you have to believe that rates are going to continue to rise going forward if you think that that's going to continue to be a headwind and by a similar amount, you know, by some amount. If rates rise, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 basis points over the next year, it's really not going to make that much of a difference. Uh, But the second point I would make, and this is a little bit more controversial, is um, investor rates, interest rates also represent, among other things, among inflation, growth expectations, interest rates also represent a measure of risk. And for the past 10 years, central bank authorities around the world have tried to lower the perceived risk rate by maintaining very low interest uh, rates of interest so that people would invest and get the economy starting again. That'll be debated for for decades as to the efficacy of that. But as a practitioner in the field right now, I have to point out that many dividend-paying securities tend to be lower risk, naturally. They just tend to be non-cyclical, older, more mature businesses. And in an environment of unusually low risk rates or interest rates, call them one or the other, they kind of have to compete for capital with companies, I don't know, social media companies, new, new economy companies that may be much more risky, but look pretty good because interest rates are low. So on one hand, I actually want rates to rise because I want investors to begin to realize that solid cash flow generating and distributing companies are out there and they are not necessarily uh, super cyclical, and they're not going to disappear because interest rates go to four or five percent. And I think investors will come to appreciate dividend-oriented investments, companies that can and pay uh, do can and do pay dividends when they begin to think about risk. So on one hand, it's a bit of a headwind. On the other hand, I'd like to see it because it's going to, you know, wake people up to uh, the virtues of dividend investing when they realize that uh, a company that can pay a dividend is probably a pretty stable operation. And if interest rates rise and risk comes back into the calculation of investors and business people around the globe, it's a good thing to have those types of companies uh, in your portfolio. So Daniel, if I could go back to the topic of the central banks, 
I received a question from a financial advisor, Michael Kreimer of AssetWise Financial in Charlotte, and his question was around what role the central banks globally have to play in the efficacy of modern portfolio theory. What are your thoughts on that? Huh. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a great answer for that, other than there is, I think, over time, a feedback loop to central planners, uh, whether it's at, at treasury government or the central banks that if the stock market is high then things are good if the stock market is low things are bad and the stock market really should be the reflection of underlying conditions not the driver of underlying conditions and in a system that focuses less on cash flows and more on uh, share prices, which what MPT has led to, at least in the United States. And by the way, most markets outside the United States, not all, but most of the mature kind of Anglophone markets outside the United States are much more cash flow oriented than the U.S. is. So this comment's more limited to the U.S. But um, in a system that encourages share price speculation rather than underlying business investment, um, the uh, you know that intellectual that paradigm, that framework. Uh, you have the central bankers maybe over the last couple of decades thinking too much about share prices uh, and when they go about setting uh, interest rates and trying to influence the economy. So I wouldn't say there's a direct link, but I, I would everyone who's you know part of um, the Federal Reserve is you know fluent in the language of modern portfolio theory, whether they believe it or not, uh, uh, and it, it's hard to imagine that it hasn't had an influence and perhaps too much of a focus on share prices as opposed to underlying cash flows. The speculative bubbles that we saw, the internet bubble is the best example. You know, uh, according to modern portfolio theory, 1999, you know, early 2000 was fine. What's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong. It's all good. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at cash flows, however, you might've come to a different conclusion. So uh, I, I'm not going to make a direct link between uh, Fed policy and, and MPT, but uh, I think there's probably uh, some sort of leakage of one over to the other. Let's go back to what you just said about 1999, early 2000, as it relates to cash flows. Are you speaking specifically to those internet startups that didn't have cash flows, or did the cash flow rate of the market as a whole start to drop? Oh, the, ca the, the dividend yield of the market as a whole got to around 1%. It's just above 1%, if I'm not mistaken, the low point. Uh, it got ridiculously low. So you would put money into the S&P 500. That was for the S&P 500. Put money in the S&P 500, you were literally getting a 1% cash return. So your entire investment proposition was about share prices at that point. And uh, for better, or for worse. And that is, was historically a low. We've never gotten that low uh, in terms of the yield of the S&P 500 since it was created in 1957. The yield until the 1980s uh, uh, was kind of in the 4 to 6% range. It depended on, on uh, the time. And during the 80s and 90s, it gradually came down as share repurchase programs and interest rates. Interest rates came down and share repurchase, brand, share repurchase programs went up. Dividend payments and dividend yields declined. The market had a great you know, uh, tech rally in the late 90s. You get this extreme event where you have uh, assets, but for investors, not maybe not company owners, but investors, there was minimal cash associated with said assets. That, in my world, as a business person, is a warning sign. And uh, you know, that's why I think investors should demand cash uh, from, their, from their investments. Daniel, I have really enjoyed this interview. I've learned a lot. How could listeners find out more about you, your work, and your new book? Uh, they can go to uh, www.strategicdividendinvestor.com, which is the website. That happens to be the name of one of the prior books, but it also has information on the current book and has uh, information uh, about uh, me as well. Excellent. I'll have links to that in the show notes. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Jay.